Special Operations. Covert Ops. Espionage. The Team House. With your hosts, Jack Murphy and David Park. Murphy here with Dave Park. Our guest on today's show is De Jay Dorlius. He served in 3rd Special Forces Group. Before that was a conventional engineer, uh, served as a Special Forces engineer, uh, and then a team sergeant mm -hmm. in 3rd Group uh, with deployments to Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, Jay also runs a YouTube channel called The Green Beret Chronicles. Uh, go take a look at that. And Jay, thanks for uh, coming in studio, man. Of course, man. Of course. I appreciate you guys having me. All right, so... Looking forward to this. Yeah. You guys are one of the few Green Beret podcasts out there, you know what I mean? So I'm really happy to be on here. And you're originally from Brooklyn, right? Yeah. So um, I was originally born in Haiti, mm -hmm. uh, but when I was 10, um, we moved here, right? So I uh, grew up Crown Heights area, mm -hmm. uh, moved out of there, went towards Brownsville, yep. spent some time down there, and then uh, Canarsie. Uh, prior to uh, joining the military in 2003. So, so what, uh, what inspired you to join the military? As you know, there's not too many people from, you know, where we're from in yeah. New York, where either, where either of us are from yeah. that end up joining the military. So for me, um, so I was one out of eight kids, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, growing up in New York City, man, like there wasn't a lot of um, opportunities. I was a horrible student. <laughs> um, and for me, it was a way out. Right. I'm, I can sit here and say, hey, I was patriotic. I wanted to go do, you know, my part for, you know, um, God and country. But for me, it was just, hey, like mom and dad has seven other kids to worry about. I'm of age. I'm becoming my own man. I, I need to go find something else to do. Mm -hmm. um, and after high school, uh, like high school was was easy, but college was a different beast. Right. So I got good grades in high school. My guidance counselor was like, hey, you're, you're really smart. Why don't you go to college? So I was like, fine. I'll, I went to City College in Harlem. And then, dude, that was horrible. Uh, teachers didn't really, the teachers don't care in college, right? They get up there, they give you their lecture, and you either listen or you don't. They're getting paid either way. As opposed to high school, my teachers were getting after me. They were right. like, hey, get your homework done, turn it in. I'm going to call your mom. I'm going to do this. College, he was like, hey, man, you want to come here and slept? Sure, go ahead. Like, I don't care. Yeah. And that's what I did. Like, I showed up to English 101, and I just fell asleep. And the professor would wake me up just in time to leave. So horrible grades. Um, but I was smart enough to realize at a very early age, like, hey, college isn't going to work. So instead of doing what most kids nowadays do and just change majors and just keep uh, forcing it down in death row to try to make it work, I just left. I was like, you know what? College isn't going to work. I need to do something else. Um, and my first option was NYPD. Like, I wanted mm -hmm. to be a New York City cop. And the reason why I chose public service was because, hey, we're, we're from Haiti. This country's taking us in, uh, my family. And I was like, well, how can I repay this debt, right? Like, how can I give back to this country for what it's done for my family? Mm -hmm. So I wanted to be a New York City cop. So I went in there. I spoke with the recruiter. He was like, hey, um, in order to be a New York City cop, you have to either have two years of college or military experience. Um, college wasn't going to work. So I was like, you know what? Fine. I'll do military. Mm -hmm. So um, that's what drove me to joining the military. So I went in there, spoke with the recruiter. And I'm like, hey, man, like, um, I want to join. I took the ASVAP and then uh, ended up watching one of those high-speed videos that they show every single one of us. Mine was a, an engineer blowing <laughs> stuff up, right? Slow crawling, landmines, and then uh, building the bridges and blowing them up. And I was like, yep, I want to be a combat engineer. Um, and I signed my contract, man. In 2003, um, I shipped off to a basic training down in Fort Linwood, Missouri. Mm -hmm. So, yep. And so how did you take the military life from Brooklyn to Fort Leonard Wood and going through all of your training to become a combat engineer? Man, uh, it was rough, man, because <laughs> you know, like you guys know, being from the city, you wear it like a badge of honor, right? Like there was five of us that, that joined out of uh, New York, and we were all in the same basic training class. So we rolled in there like, yo, we're from Brooklyn. Like we're tough. We're rough. Right. We're t you know, like we we were like our own little gang within basic training. And 
So I had a rough time breaking out of that uh, because drill song would get in my face. And, you know, I had this one drill song specifically. Like, I, till this day, um, he's, he's all right now because <laughs> he ended up, um, he was the post song major for Fort Hood not too long ago. And I, every time I see him, I just have PTSD. <laughs> yeah, like when he spoke, he got right up in your face and he purposely spit. And I'm like, oh my God. And I'm like, dude, don't spit. You know, like he would do it on purpose. And I'm like, don't spit in my face. But he would do it. And I'm like, oh God, if I ever see this dude, I'm going to beat his ass. Um, and I've seen him a couple of times, but I didn't get a chance to because he was E7 at the time. I was still at E3. And I'm like, I'm, I'm going to get you. And then once I got to SF and I'm this big badass now, he's in Fort, like he's in charge of Fort Hood. Right. So I'm like, I'm not going to go mess with that dude. Um, but it took a while, but eventually. Like, I started to wrap my head around why they were doing what they were doing. They were breaking us down so they can build us back up. Uh, they were um, showing us the right way to be a soldier, how to follow orders, how to do all these basic soldier tasks that uh, we didn't want to conform to. And eventually, um, I got in line, and the rest was history, man. What so. What is training for a combat engineer like? Like, do you remember how long the training is and what the yeah. different topics are? Yeah, so it was um, one station unit training at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. Okay. Um, basic training was nine weeks. And then uh, the remainder uh, eight weeks, we went over um, landmines, so identifying them and properly disposing of them. We learned how to build uh, the Bailey Bridge, uh, which mm -hmm. is a big metal bridge that we can that we haul around and throw up whenever folks need to cross um, uh, rivers mm -hmm. and such. Um, and then we learn basic demolitions mm -hmm. um, and, AI, and, and AIT. And that was, that was basically it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I didn't get to do any of the cool stuff that I saw in that video. Was, <laughs> <laughs> especially once I got to my unit, it was a completely different mission than what I thought I was going to be doing. So but, when you arrive at your, what was your first unit? And I mean, th this is getting pretty hot into the war at this point. I mean, I imagine. Yeah. So they, Iraq kicked off. So March 2003, I left for basic training. Um, June, July 2003, I think is when the second war kicked off, when Iraq kicked off. Right. And I remember this vividly because we would be like in our bays because it was open bay. I'm sure it's the same when you guys went through. But we would be in the bays just, you know doing you know activities like um folding socks or whatever and a drill song would come in and they would be like hey we just got the call everybody pack up your shit you guys are going to iraq and dude they would have us load our entire locker <laughs> we would go outside and they would have buses there as if we were gonna load them <laughs> right, you know, iraq. right and i'm talking about guys are fucking crying like we had you know other, other privates like I figured out it was just a ploy, but guys were like crying and just fucking weren't having it. They were like, oh, I need to call my mom. I need to do this. Like, are we really going? And then they have us go back inside. And they would, <laughs> but it's weird because they would do it multiple times right. and they got the same reaction. Right. And I'm like, you guys, guys caught on yeah. to this? Yeah. 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 Um, so uh, finished in July 2003 and then I got to my first duty station, Fort Riley, Kansas, Big Red One. Um, in uh, August of 2003 after um, coming back to New York for um, hometown recruiting. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and then as soon as I got there, man, um, I got to my unit, I checked in, and then my squad leader, he was like, hey, don't unpack your bags. I'm like, oh, motherfucker, I've heard this before. You're doing the same. You know my recruiter? Like, <laughs> what's going on, right? I mean, um, my drill song? Like, yeah. So I thought he was running the same ploy. So I was like, I was like, why not? He was like, oh, we're going to Iraq in, this, in September. I was like, yeah, whatever. You've been hanging out with Song First Class Davis over at Recruiting Command, I mean, <laughs> over at uh, um, um, Drill Song Command. So I went upstairs, I unpacked all my stuff, and then um, a month later, I was in Kuwait, <laughs> you know, waiting to go into Iraq. Um, so so uh, got thrown into the fire there pretty quick. <clears throat> and then what was your, how was it set up for combat engineers? Were you at, you were, so you were with, Big Red One. Yeah. Um, so were you attached basically to an infantry? Were you... Uh, so you know, to an... so the entire um, brigade got deployed. Okay. All right. So 1st Brigade, 1st uh, Infantry Division deployed. Uh, within that, you had 116 Infantry, 134 Armor, 1st Engineer Battalion. Um, but when we got there, everybody had their different mission that support each other. The infantry guys would go out and conduct patrols and raids. 
uh, 134 armor. They were out there just shooting their big ass um, uh, tanks. And then our mission was to clear the route because this is 2003. Like I was there for um, OEF one. Oh, I caught the tail end of OEF one. I stayed for OEF two, and then I left during the beginning of OEF three. So we were um, our main mission was to clear. Uh, routes for supply mm -hmm. to actually come into the country because uh, IED was still at its infancy, but they were still putting out shells on right. the side of the road. And uh, I mean, it was amateur hour, but right. they were still doing it. So our mission was clearing the routes so um, the supply line could flow into Iraq. So how would you guys interact with EOD? Because that's their job, but you guys had a big part of that too yeah. then. Yeah, so what we would do, we would go... It, when I say this in a, this is amateur hour, like we had the the one one threes tracks, they're like they're like an APC for combat engineers. Mm -hmm. right? That's what we deployed with because there was no RG thirty ones, there was yep. none of that high speed up armor stuff, right? So we deployed with our vehicles that we had at Fort Riley, Kansas, and we put sandbags at the bottom of it as if that was going to stop an IED <laughs> blast, right? So we conducted rock clearance on those, and then we conducted them dismounted. Like we were, like I remember walking up and then I saw a bag there and I kicked it. And I was like, "Oh, <laughs> hey, Sergeant, there's, there's a route." Like that's how we were conducting route clearance. So what we would do, we would go out, we would find them, um, and then we would sit on it for hours waiting on, for EOD to come out. It was, it, it was painful. Like we would go out early in the morning, like nine o'clock in the morning, find an IED, and then two two p.m. EOD would come rolling up and then they'd take care of it. Um, so we actually, because of that, the Engineer School of Fort Linwood, they created a program called uh, EOCA, EOCA, which allowed us as combat engineers to identify and also dispose of IEDs. Um, but that didn't come online until like 2007, 2008 okay. time frame. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense because, yeah. you know, EOD, like, they do a lot of stuff outside mm -hmm. of IEDs. Yeah. And you don't need that depth of training for yeah. everything EOD does. Yeah. But dismantling or, or handling uh, yeah. a uh, an IED doesn't seem... No, it's not. It's yeah. not. And at that point, like, they were so spread out. Like, it's not like they were sitting back at base camp hanging out. They were on other calls. Right. Uh, because there was IEDs being, you know, spread out everywhere within the AO. And we had, like, two or three EOD teams. So they were running out to a bunch of different calls. And by the time they got to us, they had already been on, like, 15 to 20 other missions, you know? So, Yeah. Uh, but yeah, man, that was the early part of uh, of my stay over at a first ID. And what uh, I mean, there's a second part <laughs> you're alluding to. Yeah, dude. So there's because I ended up doing two deployment with um, First Infantry Division. Mm -hmm. So 2003, 2004, I did 12 months, um, and of course, doing that stay, man, it was like the Wild Wild West. Yeah, yeah. We lost just from that deployment alone. We lost like 11 dudes. Wow. Um, IEDs. Mm -hmm. The company commander got blown up. The first sergeant got blown up. The supply guy, the mechanic. Um, so we lost 11 dudes to that. And of course, you know, as I'm, I'm PFC at that point, and I'm out there, you know, picking up body parts and yeah, putting yeah, them in yeah. fucking bags. So I was like, Jesus fucking Christ! Like this got to be something else, right? Right. Um, so I got back and I just spiraled out of control. Like I was just a menace to society from Brooklyn. I went back to my hood days, right? <laughs> uh, just causing havoc everywhere, man. Um, it, but it wasn't just me. It was all the other low enlisted guys yeah, that, yeah, yeah. because you figure, I'm 19, man. Right. Like, I shouldn't be, you know, like <clears throat> on the side of a riverbed picking up, you know, body parts of my squad mates. Right, right? yeah, right. You're, you're so, letting off all that steam when yeah, you get home, yeah. yeah. And we didn't know how to cope with it. Right, so, yeah, yeah. Our way of coping with it was going down to Aggieville and beating up on the football players. Right. right? Like, that's what we did. So right. we got back. We started partying, drinking. Every weekend, we were getting in fights, getting thrown in jail. Um, and I remember this because I had a squad leader, and his entire, like, he came, he was an, un, an outsider. He, piss, like, he PCS from a third um, ACR out of Fort Carson. And he showed up, and we were just running amok. Like, nobody could tell us nothing. Like, leadership was, was just fed up. They were like, we don't know what to do with these dudes. Just put them in headquarters. Um, and this squad leader, he, he came in. He was like, hey, I want all these guys in my squad. And his plan was to build enough paperwork to pretty much chapter us. Uh -huh. He was like, I'm, he's like, I'm, you know, God's great 
gift to the army. I'm cleaning house. We're getting rid of all these dudes. So he comes in, um, and he pretty much started doing paperwork. Like, we, we kept messing up. He kept doing paperwork. Um, and his plan was to chapter me out. I didn't find this out until, like, four years, like, ago, right? Because he and I are best friends now. Um, <laughs> but in the midst of this, we had a platoon sergeant that also came in, and he saw potential. He was like, hey, um, like, you weren't here for the deployment. You don't know what these guys went through. Like, they went through some traumatic shit. So instead of trying to give them the boot, let's find a way to help them. Because if you kick them out now, all they're going to do is all the stuff they're doing right now, they're just going to go do it in right. the civilian sector. Yeah, yeah. And now we're going to have... We broke them. Yeah. The least you can do is fix yeah, it. Yeah, right? exactly. Um, so that was his mindset. So um, they started to re um, just find ways to help us, man. They got us into the site. We started talking. We started unpackaging a bunch of stuff. Um, and I slowly started to get my shit together. Uh, got married... I uh, realized that I do like this Army stuff. It's pretty easy. I show up. I work out. Uh, they tell me what to do. They tell me how to do it. They tell me what to wear. Like, I have everything that I need. I needed structure, and the Army gave me that. Mm. Um, and I started to flourish. Um, got promoted, uh, made E6 within four years, and then we deployed again in 2007, uh, this time to, to Crete, Iraq. Mm -hmm. uh, more of the same, uh, conducting rock clearance. But this time it's a little bit more advanced. We have the, the RG-33s, we have the Buffaloes, we yeah. have the robots. Uh, so that deployment wasn't as bad as the first one. But I was still losing buddies left and right. Mm -hmm. like, uh, guys were still getting blown up, this time with the covert bombs, this time with the EFPs. It's like right. as soon as we found a way to defeat one tactic, they came up yeah. with another one, right? So it was that constant chess match. Um, and this... This deployment was 15 months because stop loss kicked in around that time. Wow. Yeah. So after that, man, I had, you know, like I went through the deployment and I had enough. And I was like, there's got to be something else out there, you know. And that's when I started looking at Ranger Bat. And then that's when I discovered SF. So real quick, because you were a combat engineer, we, you know, we have to bring this up. Sure. Uh, SF tab, Ranger tab. Sapper tab. Yeah, I think it should be the other way around. It should be SF tab, <laughs> Sapper tab, and then Ranger, Ranger tab. tab. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So tell <laughs> tell us about tell us for people who don't know. Tell us what a sapper is, and you know, and you know what the school is like. Yeah. And, and everything. So um, the Sapper tab then become an actual. It's always been a tab, but it wasn't authorized to be uh, worn until like 2005. Mm -hmm. Right. So uh, Sapper tab is what Ranger's tab is for infantry guys, mm -hmm. right? Doing Sapper School, you learn a bunch of 12 Bravo combat engineer tasks, right? So uh, demo's a big one, right? Um, clearing uh, minefields, uh, watercraft operations, uh, and then we also have patrolling, right? Mm -hmm. uh, another way to describe it is, hey, Sapper, ta uh, Sapper School is the last two weeks of the 18 Charlie FTX. That's exactly what it is. You're going on demo related missions only this time after the ambush you know your um your uh, pl tells you hey grab all this stuff and bring it to the top of the hood all right now it's once it gets to the top of the hood now as a sapper i'm actually blowing that stuff up mm -hmm. i'm doing all the demolition i'm doing the time fuse and i'm actually blowing it up because in real life that's what we would do we wouldn't just leave it there for yeah, the yeah. enemy to take somebody has to blow it up right um so we actually blow that stuff up uh, but yeah, that's exactly what it is, man. It's a specialized school for 12 Bravos, mm -hmm. right? Uh, that, that, they teach leadership there uh, along with all the demolitions. So hopefully that made sense. Yeah, yeah. And, and you made sure to wear that sapper tab everywhere you went. I did, once man. You were in SF. <laughs> I did, man. <laughs> Make some days here. Because <laughs> it was one of those things like um, growing up as a combat engineer, all my leaders had sapper tabs. Just like yeah, yeah. Um, a you're, guy you're proud of up, it. I get it. Yeah. yeah. Just just like a guy going up in the infantry, his leaders had ranger tabs. Right. 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 So when I wore it down my um, uh, hallway back at drill, <laughs> guys would look. They were like, "Man, what is that? I've never, <laughs> I've never seen that." before right touching it as if it's like a foreign <laughs> object I'm like no man it's a sabotage like um and then once i got to group and eventually the 18 charlie course i told everybody i was like hey as a as a you know 18 charlie you need to go to sapper school because there's a lot of similarities with the 18 charlie course and uh the engineer school down at fort linwood because a lot of the tasks that we conduct in the 18 charlie course comes from the engineer school right? yeah that's the big army component of it like mm -hmm, uxo mm -hmm. we get from like 
my UXO instructors, when I was an instructor in the 18 Charlie course, I would have to send them to EOKA, uh -huh. that course that I was talking about that allows us to blow IEDs. I would have to send them there so they can get certified to teach UXO in the schoolhouse, right? Um, so there's a lot of uh, uh, tie-in to the engineer school back right. in Fort Lane Woods. So what year did you go to uh, SFAS and then the Q course? So um, 2008, after that last deployment to Iraq, um, again, I was fed up with losing buddies left and right. And I think the real reason why I went towards SF was like being in big army and doing that mission, like we were being um, reactive. Mm -hmm. Like it was like, Groundhog Day. We go out, we get blown up, and then we go through a battle drill. Like, there was no pursuing, there was no hunting. We are sitting ducks, man. Right. It was annoying. So I'm like, man, how do we, like, who's taking the fight to the enemy? Like, how do I get after it? Like, how do I get these guys that'll kill my buddies left and right? Um, so I did some research. Ranger Bat came up, um, and then um, that squad leader, that same squad leader that was trying to get rid of me, uh, he went to selection, right? And he didn't make it. I was like, ooh, this is a way to <laughs> show him that I'm better than him, right? Um, so <laughs> I was like, he didn't make it. And he squared away, right? He's trying to fire me. So I was like, I'm going to go to selection, right? So I went in 2008 to answer your question. Um, and I got picked up. And then I started clearing uh, Fort Riley. And then I PCS and started the Q course um, uh, early 2009. Awesome. Yeah. What, what was your relationship with him? I know you, you said uh, you guys are really good friends now. What was your relationship with him like when you came back from SFAS having been successful? At <laughs> <laughs> like, we joked around it. Like, I would tell him, hey, man, like, uh, what happened? You know, he's like, I don't know. I made it all the way to the end. I didn't get selected. I was like, yeah, that's because uh, they weren't looking for your strict military, <laughs> right. you know, dress right, dress standards, you know, but... Um, by that point, he and I had um, like a better relationship, yeah. right? Because he saw in me what that platoon saw and initially saw, mm -hmm. right? Because I became a squad leader with him. So he had first squad, I had second squad, right? Yeah. So we were peers at that point yeah. whenever I went. So, yeah, that's so, yeah. awesome. Uh, and then the 18 Charlie course, I mean, do you have any stories or anything you want to tell about that? And, go, and what was it like going through as a, a combat engineer? Yeah, so going in as a combat engineer, because at that point, I didn't have a sapper tab. Like I didn't go to sapper school until I got to like I like my first team. Oh, uh, okay. Okay. Um, that's when I went. So going in, um, uh, there as a uh, twelve Bravo, yeah, I I understood some of the tasks, but not as deep as we went into it in the eighteen Charlie course. Right? It was big army. Hey, these are landmines. These are how you put them in the ground. As, as opposed to eighteen Charlie course, it was like. Oh, these are landmines. Here are five safeties that goes with that landmine. These are five ways that it can kill you, right. essentially, is what they're telling me. Um, and this is how to properly dispose of them, right? So the 18 Charlie course um, was very eye-opening. I grow, Growing up in New York City, like, I, I didn't know how to build a house. Like, I didn't know how to lay foundation. I didn't know how to do any of that. But you get six weeks of it in the 18 Charlie course, right? Uh, special Operations Construction. And then uh, the demolition part, learning... I've always been good at math, so it was e that part of it was easy. Um, so learning how to calculate to take down trees, how to, you know, blow up bridges, like all that math that goes into that. So I thrive there. Um, then we did UXO, which is essentially, you know, learning how to do EOD's job is, right. is, is exactly what it is because you, on a team, like H and Charlie has to do that, especially if we don't have any EOD attachments, right? Uh, so I learned that, and then uh, target analysis, knocked that out, and then the FTX. Um, that's where I had a little bit of trouble because it was cold, man. <laughs> it was cold. It gets cold. Was it still out in the woods where they had that big tower in the yeah, center? Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that was one of the missions, man. Um, and for whatever reason, I couldn't get the time fuse to cooperate, right? So we'd go out on our mission, and I was the uh, um, uh, senior Charlie, uh, and we had to take down, I think it was a bridge mission that, that we had to take down. So I, we went through um, just like we were supposed to, and I had time fuse set up, and then I just couldn't mit, make the time. Um, so I failed my mission, right, um, went back through it, and that was a defeat for me that I wasn't looking forward to because we're at this point, uh, phase, this is phase three, right? I have language, and then I have Robin Sage, and I'm done. 
So I was worried about failing. So I got in my head and it really fucked with me. Um, and I didn't know how to calm my mind. Like I was worried about failing and failing and failing. And the next mission I went out and I failed it again. Right. So it's like, so when you fail it the second time, time fuse, now the, the uh, um, cadre has to, you know, build a time system and make sure that it's not the actual batch. Right, right. right. Cuz they're you're being graded in what does it have to be within 30 seconds yeah. or 60? No, it's um it's not I think it's 3 seconds, man. Oh, is it? Yeah. Yeah, 30 seconds is a long time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah 30 it, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's um um plus or minus 3 seconds. Okay. Okay. Um so Cadre then goes out um after I fell my second time and he built a time system off of that same batch that the I same was using. lot, yeah. yeah. So he goes out and he builds it, and his fucked up also. Oh, good. So I was like, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, so the time fuse itself was yes. bad. Yeah. So that lot was bad. It's like a slow burning fuse yep. or whatever. Yep. Um, <clears throat> and it's because the the weather um, has a way of affecting uh, the the time fuse systems, especially the shit we get, man. It's like from like Vietnam era. Right. Like right. it's old the stuff they're pulling. Yeah. yeah. Out of storage. Yeah. Um, so he goes through. He builds his, and his also misfires. So I'm like, yes. I'm not getting recycled, right? Because he can't make it work. Like, how does he expect me to make it work, right? I'm a student. You're the expert. You're yeah. teaching me this stuff, right? <laughs> um, so because the lot was bad, I ended up, you know, getting a third mission. And this time, we didn't do time fuse. We just did uh, command debt, mm -hmm. you know what I mean, which is pretty self-explanatory. Right. Uh, so I ended up, you know, getting through the H&Charlie Charlie course. But for a moment there, like, I was worried that I was going to get recycled and at that point in time, if you get recycled um, and you fail like one other thing, then you're kicked out the Q course, right? Never to return. Um, so that all played in my head, and it's, I'm I'm learning it from it now. Um, as far as how I should have dealt with it, as far as hey, read like you know the information, you pass all the exam, you've done all the work, like reassuring myself, you know what I mean? But at that point in time, like I I was a mess, man. I was like, man, I, Jay, I'm how, gonna fail. You you mentioned. Special operations construction, and mm -hmm. this is something I don't think we've really gone into depth on this show. No. But can you talk a little bit about the 18 Charlie? Not just like the wartime 18 Charlie, all the unexploded. Yeah. We, when we say yeah. UXO, we mean unexploded ordnance yeah. uh, and demolition and stuff like that, which I think people often think about with Charlies. Mm -hmm. But like building a house, like what what is the role of the 18 Charlie on a team? So the 18 Charlie is responsible for. Because the best way that I explain it, and it goes for all of our MOSs, is the 18 Charlie MOS is eight separate jobs packed in one, right? So you have your big army component, which is the 12 Bravo. Then you have your supply guy, right? Um, like, so when I was on a team, not only was I responsible for, uh, you know, the IED, the demo, I was also responsible for building my base camp. Mm -hmm. Right, at which the 18 Charlie, like that's that's one of your your functions. Like you acquire building materials and you build uh, this base camp. We did VSO, and that's exactly what I did. Mm -hmm. Village stability operations in 2010. I you know had my little workforce. I ordered you know all the building materials, and then we built a shit ton of B huts. Right, um, we laid foundations. Right, um, I also ran that base camp as the camp mayor. Mm -hmm. Right, responsible for getting the cook all the supplies he needed responsible for getting the dudes whatever they needed right essentially a glorified supply guy right i did all of that and also base defense too. Base right? de no well base defense is the bravo okay but whatever the bravo needs constantino wire hesco's like that would fall on my shoulders to mm -hmm. get for him right so um in a nutshell man so um jack of all trades mm -hmm. when it comes to the 18 charlie because all the other guys like the 18 Bravo has his base defense and all of that. The Echoes, comms, the Delta has his clinic, right? Everybody has their little part, but I always joke, like if you have a, 18, a shitty 18 Charlie, you're gonna feel it. Yeah. <laughs> right? If you have a shitty Echo, you might notice something once you're out on a mission, right? If your Delta sucks and you get shot, yeah, you're gonna know it then, but if you don't have an 18 Charlie, you're gonna feel it right away because your quality of life is gonna be shit. Mm -hmm. You won't be able to get anything that you need. Your mm -hmm. property book will be all messed up, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. So um, I always joke Jack of all trade and probably one of the, um, I'm not gonna say the most important MOS, but definitely one of the uh, most important MOSs mm -hmm. that needs to be solid when it comes to the team room. Yeah. 
And so you talked about uh, going back to the Q course. I mean, you get your language, you get uh, go to Robin Sage, and then did you know you were going to third group? No. So I'm a French speaker. Right. Um, so when I got to language, I already had like a... You grew up speaking French. Yeah, yeah. So I already had like a DLPT awesome. score. Um, but like throughout that, you know, year long process, like I grew pretty tight with the dude. So I didn't want to jump ahead. Language was six, six months at that point. So I was like, man, I don't want to leave this group of dudes. So I opted to go back through language so I can stay with the dudes. Uh, but what that did was it, it decreased my chance of getting third group. Right. So when I graduated, I had orders to go to 10th group. Right. Um, but I wasn't trying to have that. I was like, uh, uh-uh, I can't go to 10th group. Um, Europe, I was like, no, I'm going to lose my mind, right? Um, so I went to the uh, um, battalion CSM, Bob, I think it was Bobby Senko at that point. And I was like, hey, like, my, my wife is going to um, ECU. Like, I just moved her out of K-State so she could come here. Like, I can't move my family again. And he was like, I don't know what to tell you, man. Like, you got orders for 10th group. I was like, shit. So uh, I found a classmate that was also an 18 Charlie and who also had French. And he had orders to third group. And he didn't want to go to third group. He wanted to go out to uh, Fort Carson. So he and I did a one for one. Yeah. So he ended well, up going oh, cool. to Carson. I, 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 I was going to say that your desires pretty, are pretty much counter to typical. Yeah. So I, I imagine that it wouldn't have been too hard to find. Yeah. You know, somebody <laughs> to swap with. People would have been like lining up. You could like auctioned it off on, yeah. you know, auctioned the spot off. Yeah, because at that point, a uh, third group had just switched its AO from its area of operations from Africa to just Afghanistan. Yeah. Right? They were like, "Yep, that's what the fight is." Like, we're 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 going straight there. I didn't know that at the point. I just didn't want to go to Fort Carson. Yeah, you know what I mean. So, but um, it all worked out. Yeah. Right? So. So tell us about like landing on your first ODA, what that experience was like. Oh man. So, so I got done with the Q course um, and I took about two weeks worth of leave. Um, and when I showed up to a third uh, group, there was the group headquarters was for deploy. So um, the, the group CSM and the group commander, they were both at Camp Vance down at uh, Siege of Soto because mm-hmm. third group had the uh, um, Siege of Soto at that point. So I showed up, um, group headquarters is empty, you know what I mean? So uh, staff duty takes me to the back, and they were like, hey, nobody's here. I was like, well, I'm here. Like, what do you, <laughs> like, <laughs> you guys got to do something with me, right? Um, so they, so I deployed right away. Um, so within two weeks, I was um, en route to Afghanistan to uh, go to Camp Vance and, lake, uh, and make a link up with third group. So I go over there in process, group headquarters, got a chance to speak with the uh, battalion commander, um, Colonel Bulldog, or General Bulldog, and then uh, uh, the battalion CSM, or group CSM. And I told him, hey, I just got out the Q course. Um, I'm, I'm ready to go to whatever team you want me to go to. Um, and they're like, nope, you're not going anywhere. Uh, we need you here at the VDOC. And I'm like, base defense, uh, whatever the acronym is. I'm like, so you keeping me here at Bagram um, as opposed to me going to Kandahar or wherever yeah. and link up with the dudes. Um, so I ended up staying at the uh, uh, bath for shit, four, four months. It's a depressing oh, place. I'm sorry. Dude, it was horrible, man. Yeah. It was <laughs> fucking horrible. Um, but I was like, hey, since I'm going to be here, I'm going to make the best out of it, right? Because now I'm the camp mayor. <laughs> you know? Um, I'm I became the guy on Camp Vance. Everybody knew me, so I was like, oh, man, this SF guy stuff is, is awesome, right? So I'm just, I'm living too good, right? Like I say, <laughs> as a new guy, I'm living, like, way too good to where I started to piss some people off. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, dude, it was, I can't make this shit up, man. Like, I was, like, we were throwing parties, <laughs> like, um, like, we were inviting, like, uh, chicks from like dis um, from like big army to come on a camp uh, vans and we were like every Thursday, dude. We had a little bee hut by the bee dock and we were just pouring it up every Thursday like clockwork. We were having parties in there and finally somebody 
I'm not going to say his name, <laughs> but somebody went to the group CSM and they were like, hey, for a new guy, Jay shouldn't be having this much fun. <laughs> <laughs> those were his exact words. Right, right. <laughs> because I was sitting at one of those parties and the, the S1 and COIC came in. And he was like, Jay, like, what would you do? I was like, what do you mean? He was like, yo, such and such just went to Group CSM and he told them that you are having too good of a time. You need to go grunt it out like all the other SF guys and earn your keep to have this much fun. And I'm like, <laughs> I showed up right. ready to go to a team. Right. I didn't choose this, but if you're going to give it to me, I'm not just going to suck right. and be miserable. Like I'm going to have a good time, right? Come to find out later on, that guy was upset because there was a certain girl that he was pursuing <laughs> yeah, that yeah, yeah. was hanging out with me. Yeah. And I'm like, man, this dude is supposed to be like a senior leader. Like, I'm just an E6. This dude is like an E9. Like, why is he worried about me? But he wanted the girl. Yeah. And he couldn't have it because I had her. So yeah. he had to get, he had to remove me from the picture. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but bro, like within two days, I was on a C-130. <laughs> like literally en route to fucking um, sort of south. Like, I was like, I didn't even get a chance to say goodbye or anything. <laughs> um, so... I get to Kandahar, and that's where 1st Battalion was, right? So 1st Battalion was down there. Um, leading up to that point, like, throughout my entire four months there, I had buddies that I graduated the Q course with that was, you know, doing work in sort of South. So I was talking to them on the regular, like, hey, do you guys need a Charlie? Like, I'm over here. If I get a chance to leave, like, can I come to your team? So I was already politicking and networking. So whenever I got the boot, I went straight to sort of South, and I was able to get on a team right away. Um, but once I got there, man, I was like, I wasn't ready for the new guy shenanigans, uh, cause I didn't know anything about it. Right. So I showed up and for the first four months, no one called me by my name. I think they called me Daryl. And I was like, <laughs> but shit, man, just call me token. Like what the yeah. fuck, right? <laughs> but you know, they called me Daryl. Um, I had a little box that they made me build to keep all my clothes in. Um, uh, but Throughout all of this, like I was still, you know, like building the fire base because this was the, the era of, um, I think it was McChrystal, his coin, yeah, yeah, you know, village stability operation yeah. stuff, right? It was like 2010, 2011. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So this is 2010. Um, so doing, you know, all that stuff, like I'm, I'm building like uh, the fire base with my, uh, a senior, um, you know, uh, managing the base camp, uh, running the workforce, training the ALP managing the NASF so um but as a new guy man like even though all that shit was going on like I just did my job right you know what I mean like I I earned my keeps you know what I mean because I knew why they were doing it and I'm like dude I, I grew up in New York City like you're not gonna get under my skin <laughs> right by talking now if you if you put hands on me it's different uh but eventually once they realized it was just talking it wasn't affecting me then everything kind of started to switch, and I slowly started to uh, integrate myself into the actual team. Now, um, in uh, in 2010, a lot of the guys had probably had quite a bit of experience in mm -hmm. Afghanistan. What was that like for you coming in, brand not only a brand new Charlie, but also brand new to this combat environment? Oops. Oh no, but you had already been. I'm sorry. So you, I thought, yeah. right? So my so we're in Kandahar in my Camp Brown, and my team comes to pick me up. And my team sergeant goes, you know, hey, um, like, I need you to get on the gun trucks. And he starts telling me what I need to do, right? And I look at him, I'm like, hey, sergeant, like, like I've deployed before. I right. know what I'm doing. Dude, he looks at me. <laughs> and we all know, like, that's something you don't do, right? Especially to your team sergeant. He doesn't even know me. He looks at me. He was like, this ain't that type of war. This isn't Iraq. <laughs> This is the Wild Wild West, right? And I'm like, oh, shit. You know, he didn't talk to me for like two weeks <laughs> just because of that statement. But um, to your point, it was completely different because, like I mentioned earlier, uh, Iraq, I was, you know, reactive. Right. Something happens and then we react to it. Now we're being proactive. We're going out on missions every day and we're creating white space, right? right. So I was loving it, man. It was, it was exactly what I was looking for to answer your question. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, sorry. For some reason, my mind blanked out on that on your first two deployments. But no, no, and and what like what was it? How did the team treat you? Like knowing that you, you sort of already had all you know this experience as a, as yeah. a twelve Bravo. It didn't matter, man. Okay, no, it didn't matter at all. I was still the new guy because, and I tell guys this now whenever they reach out to me for uh, um, guidance. I'm like, you, you got to understand, you're going from a conventional space to a unconventional space now. Just because you've deployed before, you know, with Big Army, um, your missions were probably different than what you're going to do in SF. Right. All right. So, and it was. What I was doing when I was a Big Army was, even the way we cleared IEDs were completely different than how I used to do it. Yeah. It was, hey, there's an IED over there. I'm like, I'm like oh, where's the robot? You know, like, where's, and my senior Charlie's like, robot what are you talking about <laughs> man like just go over there i'm like i'm not going over there <laughs> he's like i'm not going you're the junior go over there right but um it was different like we you know walked around look for command wire you know we cut it if we found it if there was no command wire we had the backpack jammers like and if it was something that wasn't saved we just mark and bypass As right a big army there is no mark and bypass we have to get rid of it so even you know um it was different from that aspect. So everything that we were doing was, was completely different. Um, and it really opened my eyes. I'm like, man, like, I wish I had done it earlier. Uh, but I didn't know about it until yeah. that point in my career. So. When, when you were uh, with Big Red One, were you guys involved in any ticks? No, no. It was all, I guess you can call, we weren't involved. We were just getting shot at. Right. <laughs> right, like that. I wouldn't call that involved because I would... When I think of involved, I'm thinking of a two way range. Like they sh right. they're shooting, we're shooting back. It was, was more, hey, you know, we're conducting rock clearance, IED goes off, and they shoot at us. And we just stand there, like, oh, God, like, oh, shoot back. We'll shoot back. And then, but we stayed on the hardball. Like there was no maneuvering, right. there was no giving chase. And, yeah, command was just uh, risk adverse at that point. You know, that's why, like, looking back at it now, I'm like, man, we never stood a chance. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because you put an IED over there, like, Dudes get blown up, and all we do is shoot back. We we can't chase after right. them because they won't let us. Right. It was just a yeah. It was just a but, mess, man. I mean, you said that you went to SF largely for that reason, looking yeah. to take the fight to the enemy. Yeah. I mean, did you find that when you got there? Oh yeah, there? yeah. So that first deployment again, it was VSO. So we were kind of like stuck to our little village there. Right. Um, but just within that, we were able to you know um, create white space and take it to the Taliban. But then the consecutive trips, I was able to, um, like, we were a lot more kinetic. We were running commandos, like, two rotations in a row. And we had a chance to um, go all over the country. Cause, the Kandak commandos? Yeah, yeah. I had second Kandak at a, a JBAD, and they were the national response force for Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. So whenever something jumped off, they were the first to go. Yeah. So running those guys, um, we had a chance to go all over Afghanistan and just take it to the enemy. What was that like for you personally? You know, because everybody has this, you know, first sort of combat experience or this yeah. first sort of target prosecution experience. But, but you, per, you, like, you went to SF because you were tired of being on the receiving end of that. Mm -hmm. So what was it like for you personally the first time you, like, went at it, like yeah. prosecuted the target as yeah. opposed to reacted. Yeah, it was good, man, because I felt like I was getting uh, um, revenge. Yeah. Like, I was getting payback, you know, for all the dudes that I had lost prior to and couldn't do anything about. Yeah. Right? So, um, it was awesome, man. I, I think I got to the point where, uh, like most of us, I enjoyed it too much. Yeah. To the point where, um, once I got to that point in my career, it was hard to turn it off. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I found myself, like, wanting more and more of it even though there wasn't any to be had um so i would say that was a byproduct of you know that first initial experience now i wasn't cutting off ears and wearing it and right. you know anything among, along those lines um but for normal people when you take a life you feel some sort of sadness or whatever for me it was like yeah you had it coming yeah like, who's next right yeah. and that just you know over the span of you know uh you know, 12, 13 years, it just got worse and worse yeah. over the time, mm -hmm. right? To where I didn't feel any remorse at all. Yeah. You know what I mean? So um, that's the, I guess, the uh, blowback that could come from, you know, having that type of, you know, hatred that most of us have when we lose somebody. You yeah. Know what I mean, so. Uh, from that first trip, are there any, like, really, like, notable stories that stand out to you? Um, the f Yeah, so from that first trip doing VSO, the, the first one... 
that was like the first time I got shot at, I think is what stood out the most because it was just a regular patrol. Um, and we were, you know, pushing out a little bit uh, further uh, away from the VSO site at that point because we had enough white space uh, within the site to be comfortable. But we was like, yeah, we still got a village that we're responsible for, but it's a little, like, it's further out. So we had to push um, out towards that village. So we did. Um, and we went into the village, did our key leaders engagement, Kelly. Um, and once that was done, we are coming back. And then... Um, we got engaged and I remember uh, this because like we're on the other side of the wadi now heading back towards the VSO site and we had um, an element that was still coming out of the wadis and they started engaging while they were down in there so we turn around and we start shooting back and of course like your typical firefight like they're not like right up on you right, right? there there's some standoff so we're shooting at you know muzzle flashes and windows and all that stuff but their fires were pretty effective. Like, they were, like, we can see them. And I remember I was standing there, and, you know, rounds were hitting around my feet. And I just stopped, and I'm like, oh, man, this is what it feels like to get shot at. You know, not ducking for fire, like, not taking cover, none of that stuff. I was just standing there, like, oh, man. I'm, like, I was amazed by it, you yeah. know, because leading up to this point, all I saw was what's on television. Right. I'm like, oh, you get, you get shot at, it's supposed to sound like this. It's, um, but I'm like, no, this is nothing like it at all. It's just dirt coming. <laughs> like, it's just kicking up dirt, right? And I got yelled at by my, you know, senior Bravo. He's like, hey, idiot, get behind cover. <laughs> you know what I mean? But I almost got shot in the leg that day. So that would be, you know, the most memorable thing that came out of that deployment because all the other ones were, like, pretty similar, right? We would there's some standoff, they shoot at us, we shoot at them. If it lasted a certain amount of time, we call for air support, right. right? And that's how it was until I got to like the more kinetic stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, good times. Good times. Yeah, so let's jump into that working with the Kandak commandos. Yeah. Uh, you guys, uh, I imagine, had like CH-47 support get you guys where you needed to go. Yeah. So that one was, so 2012, um, we went, so that first one was... 13 months for me because I had my time at the BDOC and then I did um, uh, 10 months uh, with the team. Go back, went through all that crazy admin stuff and then we redeployed in 2012. This time we're running commandos out of JBAD. Um, and that was, um, we had, at that point we had 10 dudes on the team because you never have a full SF team. Just because, yeah, it is what it is. And then we were running a Kandak that had um, three companies, mm -hmm. and then each company's had uh, about 150 dudes, mm -hmm. right? Uh, three, three platoon um, of 50 plus dudes, right? And we would do uh, 24 on, uh, 48 off, right? So we would go out for 24 hours, we would clear a village, and then we would strong point a building, um, wait for the sun to come up, because that's when they typically fight us, and we would fight, and then we'd exfil the next um, day. Um, so we did that because uh, how we root, um, how we rotate it was so um, there'll be a Kandak on green cycle, there'll be one on amber, and there'll be one on red, just like we have ours, mm -hmm. right? Um, so whichever one was on green cycle, we did missions with them, um, and then whenever uh, we were back, we would train the other ones. We would go check out their training. So that 48 off tip wasn't really off because we would right. still go train right, the other right. guys. Uh, so, but that one was good, man, because... Um, one, we had a chance to, you know, um, be in helicopters everywhere we went and we had all the, um, air support whenever we went out, right? Which, uh, made it that much like, more better. My father-in-law would say, right? Um, so yeah, we had a ball, uh, one of the, probably one of the best missions that I did during that rotation was we got a chance to go back to cop Kading, right? So in 2000 and, uh, April of 2012, and for those that don't know about Calcating, that was where um, that entire five got overran, mm -hmm. right? And Nurse then, they, they had it at the bottom of the bowl, and yeah, they yeah, got yeah. overran. I remember this. Um, several guys got Medal of Honors out of that um, trip. But after that incident, the U.S. pulled, uh, the coalition pulled everybody out of that area, right? There was no uh, U.S. presence at all. The only thing that was left was the... Uh, militia that was, you know, um, guarding that area or that lived in that area. So in 2012, 
um, the militia was get was was getting ready to get overran, and then the district the um, district center was next. So we, um, since we were a national asset, we got spun up to go down to Camdash, uh, Nurse and actually um, go take 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 uh, go take the fight to um, those dudes. So we spun up um, four CH forty sevens with all sorts of air assets because, again, since we were a national um, asset. Um, the president at the cause I literally called down to see just sort of things. He was like, Hey, I need commandos in there like now. So we spun up, went down in there, um, commandos. And it was dude, it was 48 hours of just duking it out with those dudes. It was ridiculous. And I mean, that's, I've never been to Nuristan, but yeah. I've been told by many people that's like the most challenging terrain Bro, you can possibly imagine. Oh man. And th there was one, one HLZ that we had to use that was usable the other one was on camden was on katie uh-huh right so we either land at that one hlz that everyone in the area knew was serviceable or the pilots they wanted to put us down to cop katie and then we would have to fight uphill right. to get to our position we we're literally going through um the taliban as we were trying to get to the high ground we was like no we're not doing that man put us on the serviceable hlz and just have air, just have them prep the area. Yeah. And then once we're on the ground, then we can maneuver and get where we need to go. Right. What, was that serviceable HLZ? Was that at a higher elevation? Oh, yeah. Oh, it, yeah. it was literally because because the way it's set up, you know, all the collats and all that stuff. Yeah. So we had upper cam dash and then you had lower cam dash. All the bad dudes were at lower cam dash. You know what I mean? So they ended up putting us up here. Um, we linked up with the militia and then we did 150 commandos. We just let them loose, man. And I remember this because we linked up with the commander of the militia and they told us straight up, he was like, hey, all the women and children are gone. Yeah. Everybody that's down there, they're all Taliban. And my, my, my captain, he actually was with the 173rd a couple of years prior to, and he used to be in that same area. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it worked out because he still knew some of the militia dudes. And he looked at him and was like, okay, that's all we need to know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, bro, like that night, like we... We got um, into our positions, and then we just waited. And it's, it's like clockwork, man. Day breaks, because they, they knew we were there. Yeah. Like, day breaks, and it was just, oh, man, it was on. Like, they they <laughs> they, they, uh, put up, they put up a pretty good fight, because the way they were set up, like, inside those mud huts, uh -huh. they cut out, like, firing holes. So, and then they backed off all of them to where we, we didn't see the muzzle flash. Right. So the sun comes up, and we're taking, like, effective fire. Like, I'm talking about, like, you can hear the rounds going by your head, but we didn't know where it was coming from. Right. Because they were, like, inside the buildings, but they had it set up to where the rounds were still, like, a loophole. Type yeah. Of yeah. So we're like, Jesus, man, like, what is going on? Like, we don't, like, we hear it, like, it's coming in, but we don't see who we're shooting at. And finally, we, we were just like, you know, f fuck it, like, gun runs yeah right like um so we just called in cast man and it was like hey all of this we're taking fire from right here and it's effective like get the freaking um apaches down here and just fucking like level all this stuff right and that's what they so as soon as the apaches started doing that they started to run right and at that point you got commandos with the 240s up top like we got our freaking um gustavs and it was just like open season man uh 40 Eight hours later, like 68 EKIA. Wow. That was the first two days. How, how are you guys getting, I mean, I assume that over 48 hours, you have to get some combat resupply. Yeah. Right? How are yeah. you guys getting So, that? So um, prior to leaving, as the 18 Charlie, I had uh, bundles, speed bundles um, um, uh, planned, uh -huh. right? So we had um, air resupply schedule. And then we also had, like, we also um, went in heavy. Since we had the CH-47s, we um, loaded that thing down. And when we came off the helicopters, we just threw everything off and we left it on the HLZ, uh -huh. right? So throughout the entire uh, uh, days, we had like the locals were on Upper Camdash with us and they had donkeys. So my team, uh, my team son had them doing runs back and forth, yeah. grabbing supply off the HLZ and bringing it down to us up at Upper Camdash. So food, water. Uh, more ammo and all that. And we had commandos, man. 150 commandos? Yeah. Like, we, we gave each of them, 
like a thing of um, Gustav round to carry because you know how there's two rounds in each. Yeah. We just handed it to him, be like, hey, carry this, carry that, carry that. <laughs> right. So we had like our own little freaking um, resupply going, and on top of that, we had those bundles that, and we ended up using them later on because we ended up staying out there for seven days, fighting wow. those dudes. Yeah. Um, I, I imagine that many Gustav rounds, like shooting that that many Gustav rounds, really rang some bells. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um, to do because I fired three and you know the max is two. I fired three and then um, of course you're not keeping count right in the heat of the moment. We're, we're just sending them. So my uh, um, Bravo had to pull me off of it and then he got on it and then we just kind of swapped out like that. Um, but yeah, it was wild, man. Because we can we're shooting from upper cam dash into lower cam dash, right? And then you can see them like going through like their Kazavak plan, right? So mm -hmm. as dudes get injured, like they're, 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 there was a bridge down the road because Pakistan is like, I would say about 10 minutes or so down the road. So um, uh, they have like a pickup come, they load up their wounded and then they haul butt, you know, and then they'll go do whatever. And then they'll, throughout the entire days, they just repeat that same process. Um, but it was nice, man, because after everything was done, we had a chance to go down to cop Kading and actually walk those same grounds yeah and it was like man they left a bunch of shit behind like what the fuck like connex is full of stuff you can tell like the taliban have been living in there just um, pillaging all that crazy stuff down there so yeah that was a pretty good experience um going back there and actually fighting off the same guys that probably had a lot to do with cop Kading. yeah yeah so that was actually pretty cool that's wild man yeah good times <laughs> All, all of these, like, there's so many uh, stories about Afghanistan that, like, unless you talk to the mm -hmm. guy who was there, like, I don't think, did this ever come out in the papers or anything? Probably not. Yeah, know? so there was, a, like, a short snippet on it about, you know, um, ODAs going back into that mm -hmm. area and, and, and doing work and killing, like, 72 plus dudes. And then um, there's a book out called The Outposts. Mm -hmm. by the guy from CNN, Jake Tapper. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's a verbiage on there about, you know, um, us being the first uh, Americans to go back there since uh, Kading fell. Mm -hmm. But again, to your point, there's a lot of history yeah, yeah. that isn't being talked about. Man. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I think we do ourselves a disservice. And until this day, similar to you guys, like I'm trying to do podcasts. I'm, 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 yeah. I'm, I'm trying to get our community out to talk more right because yeah. it's like i get it there's a difference between being a quiet professional sure like i got it man but there's just when the realm of of podcasting and social media it's not going to go away right yeah, we can yeah. be like the dinosaurs and kind of fade away right because if we don't tell the youth who we are and what we do even dude till this day man like i still get questions from some of these younger guys that reach out to me through instagram and youtube what's a green beret man like what do you guys do? Are you guys like Navy SEALs? I'm like, no, man. Like, we're a completely different entity. And yeah. These are the missions that we conduct, right? Yeah. Uncommissioned warfare. Not a lot of people can do that. Yeah. I'm having to explain to them what it is yeah. when other units have done a really good job at selling themselves. Yeah, yeah. Right. right. And that's something that we don't really do a lot of. Yeah. And there's, there's a substantial difference, you know, because you talk about the quiet professional, and there's a st substantial difference between beating your chest yeah. and... And relaying like personal history, yeah. and and while you're relaying personal history, you're relaying history itself, yeah. right? Yeah. It's it, as you tell me the story. I mean, it sounds so much like the Mike Force mission in Vietnam, yeah. or uh, Hatchet Force yeah. that Mac V. Sog had. Yeah. You know, going in heavy, yeah. Um, direct action, but working with indigenous mm -hmm. personnel. Yeah. Um, it's really cool. Yeah, yeah. And there's a lot more of these type of stories out there. Yeah. Right. We just don't know about them right right dude like we have medal of honor winners we have dudes that's done incredible things right and sometimes it breaks my heart knowing that hey that story is mm -hmm. gonna die with that dude right or some of these history it's just gonna go away and, right you know the the folks that are gonna you know backfill us are gonna have to relive some of right. those same pitfalls right. right when right. it could easily be mitigated by them getting on YouTube and watching a podcast and saying, oh, wow, Jay yeah. made this mistake or Jack made Like, let's not do that again, right? Like, that's what it's all about is better in the next generation. Well, how many, like, Vietnam lessons from Vietnam did we have to relearn? Yeah. You know, uh, you know, like, the, the heritage isn't, isn't, yeah. is not 
continued. It's not yeah. kept on, yeah. unfortunately. Oh. Yeah. So after that one, you, you went back and did a, another deployment with Kandak? Yeah, so this one was with 2nd Kandak out of JBAD. Uh, the trip after that, 2014, we did 3rd um, Kandak out of Gordes. Um, we did a rotation uh, with them, and that was a really kinetic operation too. Like That one itself was, you know, like, 2015, like we're done in Iraq, right? Like we're, we're, this was the era where we closed everything down. Right. And then we went back in and opened everything up, right? Uh, so that one, um, out of Gordes was more um, um, area focused. So we didn't have the entire country at that point. We just had our little slice of the pie. Um, and that one was just more of the same, just kinetic. Uh, but the only different there was, hey, like they already told us that we're leaving. After this, like, this is the last hoorah. Right, right, right. right. Um, we're closing, like, we, we were going out and conducting ops, and then we were retrofitting a base camp at the same time, right? Yeah. Uh, so that one was a different beast, uh, because I don't know how to, the Taliban found out that we were supposed to leave. Um, so it was sporadic um, here and there, because we would go out, you know, have an awesome mission, get into some firefight, and then we'd go out the next day and it'd be dead, because... At that point, they're just waiting us out. Right. right. They're like, hey, you guys are leaving right. in a couple of months. Then we can have all this shit, right? Um, but that one, I remember uh, I got one takeaway from that. And that was a lot of people call it your um, happy to be alive day or whatever. You know sure. what I mean? So um, I remember when I got shot at, and I also remember when I almost died. You know what I mean? Um, and this one in particular, we had hit this village. Um, it wasn't even our op. It was a first group team that um, that wanted that needed support uh, because since we had commandos, if other teams want us to come in and help them, since we had like 150 dudes, like we can easily go in and support them. So they requested us to go in. So we went in there and we cleared this entire village. And I remember um, we got done with the clearing operation. Uh, we strong point. And then we just kind of hung out. But the day prior, too, there was no move. Like, there was no intel saying that there was bad dudes there. We didn't have any issues while we were clearing through the village. So we're like, oh, this is another dead spot. Like, whatever, man. Like, we're just going to hang out. Um, so I'm talking about we, we, we had um, the American flag. We had the Texas flag under that. Just my, one of my buddies was suntanning. Like, it was like, okay, this is what we're doing, right? Um, so <laughs> I was on... Uh, one of the rooftops with my buddy and we were just talking. Um, and at that point we, every time we go out, we always rolled in heavy. Like that's something that we've always done. So my Bravos were genius in that way that they brought it, they brought out the, uh, uh, the, uh, the grenade launcher. Well, I can't, Mark 19. Right. Uh, so, yeah. Um, so, okay. so yeah. we had the Mark 19. There's an, we we also had the Mark fourteen, the handheld one. Oh no no no! This is like the Mark nineteen. Gotcha. The yeah. vehicle mounted. The vehicle the, mounted yeah. one, right? Yeah. Because we have the commandos. We're like, yo, like wherever we went, we always rolled heavy. Worst case scenario, right? So we had the Mark nineteens. Uh, we had the mini gun. We had all that stuff. And every time we strong point, because we would always roll with the razors. Also, um, every time we strong point, we took them off the vehicles, the razors, and then we put them on top of the buildings and we build fortify um, uh, fighting positions, right? We had all the command, we always had all the commandos fill sandbags and like we set it up as if we're expecting a fight. Yeah. So we had it set up, uh, you know, identical to how we've done it like hundreds of times. And, but this time instead of manning it and hanging it, like we're just hanging out because we're not expecting a fight. Um, so we're up there talking and then like, I remember it vividly. Like, he and I were talking face-to-face, -face, and I, I heard the rounds go in between him and I. That's how close oh they were. Oh, my God. And it was like, Phew. And then I watched it hit. There was a first group dude with us. He had a scar heavy. The rounds hit his scar and ricocheted into his bicep. Oh, no shit. Yeah, so he got hit, and then... I just jumped off because I like I didn't have my kit on, I didn't have my gun on, like I didn't have anything. I was just up there just playing around, right? So I dove off the roof, um, and my buddy did the same. And then that entire morning was just us 
going back and forth with them, Call G's, the Mark 19. I was like, holy shit. The um, first group dude, like his bicep was all like tore up. His uh, score heavy was all messed up. And I was like, man, I, I credit it to, to my lucky hat. That's why I wear this thing all the time. And I'm like, oh, man, this, this hat has saved my life more time than I can remember. Um, but, yeah, so that was the – because just an inch over – and my whole jawline would have been gone yeah. if not my, my entire, like, head. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, that's how close I came to not even having a freaking face. You yeah. Know? So. How, yeah. How, how easy was it for you guys, it's being uh, Kandak, how easy was it for you guys to get air on station and could pretty you easy. stack it? Yeah. Pretty easy. Pretty easy because um, running commandos, man, you, you get everything that you asked for. So we had two JTACs, um, two combat controllers that, that were attached. Um, and everything we went on were um, level ones, right? So l that's just the level of the con up for the audience if you guys don't know what we're talking about. So with the level ones, we, we had the ability to, you know, gunships, Apaches, like we had all of that. Um, but they weren't, they were there for infill and exfill. Right. And then on, st like during the uh, actual engagement, we would still have to call and ask for it, but oftentimes... So you didn't have a ton of stuff on station no, during no, an operation? No, stuff like no, that. no. Just, they cover infill and exfill, because we both know, like, that's the most dangerous time. Yeah. But um, during the day, since it's a 24-hour op, they push off and go support um, whoever. But if we did get into a firefight and we call for support, they normally show up, because yeah. we were still priority. You yeah. know what I mean? So, so yeah. And so as time goes on, I mean, you're doing these deployments and when was it about that you took a team sergeant position? So 2014 uh, into 2015, we get back from that rotation. And at that point, I'm like, man, this, this, we just closed down a base camp. Like this, there's no more fight to be had. Right. So I, I, went, I go to SWIC mm -hmm. um, and I go to the H and Charlie committee. Um, I was a UXO instructor. Uh, then I was the op sergeant over there, and then I became the committee chief. Um, and then I got promoted out of SWIC, um, and then went back to third group and took over uh, my team in 2019. 2019. Awesome. Yeah. Yep. And then from there, probably the best job in the regiment. You know what I mean? Because at that point, man, like I'm, you know, I had like, I had a really young group of dudes. Right, uh, but my most senior guys had two years in. Wow! Know, so it was all eighteen X-rays. Yeah, on the yeah. pretty much. Yeah. yeah, to where I had to go outside and recruit some senior guys just to help mentor those dudes. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, but it was awesome, man, because now I had a chance to you know coach, teach, and mentor right. and right. develop all those guys. Um, until this day, man, like. Um, I'll hit them up and be like, hey, man, I'm going to New York for the Team House podcast. Give me two coins, right? And then yeah. they give me two coins, right? Uh, um, so some of the best dudes that I've ever worked with. Man. That's cool. It's, yeah. It's, it's pretty awesome. So what, what was it like being a team sergeant? I mean, aside from what you described, I mean, like operationally. Yeah. At that time, 2019, 2020? Yeah. So 2019, um, I always joke that I had my hardest deployment in 2019 because when you're in Iraq, I mean, when you're in Iraq or Afghanistan, like, you know your left and right limits. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, hey, I'm going to wake up, I'm going to do this, I'm inside the wire. Once I go outside the wire, it's game on, mm -hmm. right? Enemy shooting at me, I'm shooting back yep, at them. Yep. Um, 2019, I took my team to Jordan mm -hmm. for seven months, all right? And I, t t like, so you're sending me to Jordan, permissive area of operation, guys can go drink, guys can go party, Guys can essentially hang themselves if they wanted to, right? Just right. through all the lots of ways to get in it. Yeah, yeah, not literally hang yeah, themselves. Yeah, yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? but, but tons of ways. A lot, they're given a lot of rope. Yeah, basically. Ton, tons, tons yeah. of way to get in trouble. Yeah, but I've always been that leader to where, like, I'm a demand, um, not necessarily demand, but I treat my guys in a manner as if they were my own kids, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Like I invest in them. I took care of them to where when it's time for them to do the same for me, they'll do that, right? Mm -hmm. So when we hit Jordan and we're, you know, working with the uh, Jordanian uh, Special Forces guys, like we train them from 7 to um, about 1 o'clock and then guys are off, right? Spread to the fall winds to go do whatever they want to do. But at no point in time did any of my guys ever get in trouble because 
I had, you know, instilled that discipline in them. And they gave a shit about me. And they knew, hey, if I go drinking and I get myself in trouble, then Jay's going to get fired. And then who knows who we're going to get in here. And he's going right. to fuck shit up, right? So um, I say it was the hardest deployment because for me, it was hard. Because it's like, man, I have no control over my dudes. Right. right. Like, I'm not going to, you know, um, you know, restrict them to, you know, Kasadic or the base that we were at. I want to let them go do all that stuff, right? Like, and I want to trust that they're going to do the right thing. But at night, I was still like, oh, my God. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, like, right. oh, shit. Right. It's 2 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> right. like, such and such is still missing. Like, what's going on, right? So that kept me up at night because I'm like, ah, oh, I don't want to be that guy that's like, hey, man, where you at? It's 2 o'clock. Like, you supposed to be? No. I'm like, nope. These, these are grown men. Like, go, like. If I can't trust you here, then how am I going to trust you in combat? Yeah, like, yeah. I should be able to give you your, your you know, um, your left and right limits. Hey, you guys can go out and do whatever, but you know, don't fight with the locals or don't drink, don't drive drunk. Like I should be able to give you simple guidance and you follow them in a permissive country. And yeah, be okay. Right? Yeah. If you can't do that, then you don't belong on this team. Um, and it worked out perfectly, man. Like we did seven months down there working with the Jordanians, and then we came back and no incident at all. So, Out of curiosity, why why did third group go to Jordan? Because fifth group couldn't hold their own. <laughs> but no, so at this point, fifth group was heavy in Syria. Um, they were doing a lot of work in Syria, and our dwell time, as far as head to pillow, was getting out of whack for fifth group. Right, so. Um, uh, so come so it fit for us to step in and uh, uh, rotate in Syria and also Jordan and also Lebanon to give them a break. Okay. Um, and we did just that. We had a team in Lebanon. Uh, my team was in Jordan. We had guys at Tower 22, um, ATG, uh, Kobani, and all those other places. Uh, TNF. Yeah. 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 But, yeah, it was just to give them, like, a quick a, um, break so they yeah. can get back on a cycle because a lot of folks like when they you know hear you know sf guys they don't realize that we're a line based on language and so fib group had like they've been in the middle east for so long and uh you know your first groupers are probably doing sit in thailand and yeah they don't rotate over there as much right so these guys are stuck like going back to back to back yeah and it's up to the leadership of it's so to say hey man like let's rotate some of these guys in yeah. so these guys don't get burned out um so they did that we went in i was like man jordan is awesome you know what i mean so it was a good trip overall that's cool yeah. and so how did uh you came back home and then how did you sort of like wind down your career in the army um so i got back um and i was supposed to do a third year as a team sergeant and at this point, like, I finally got my captain to get his shit together. Like, we're just gelling as a team, right? And we go to Safawik. We go to Safawik, and, like, team is closed. Like, mm -hmm. I'm happy. I'm having a good old time. And, of course, that's when the universe has a way of humbling you, right? Like, that's when adversity kicks in. So we're at Safawik, and I'm just having one of those days. Like, I'm on the range. Like, my team, because all we did in Jordan was, like, we trained the heck out of it. So we were, like, probably the best shooting team in the company, right? We go to Safawik, like, I had, like, five guys in the top ten stress shoot, right? So we're just crushing it. And I remember that day, like, we're doing breaching procedures, right? Mm -hmm. So we had our guns loaded, but, like, we weren't doing anything with them, right? So I get a couple of phone calls, so I step away. Um, the guys go to the bay, and they clear their stuff because it's time to leave. I clear my long gun, but I completely forgot to clear my pistol. So my pistol was still alive. Mm. So I go in the bay, and I have an ND inside the bay, right? So that took place, and I'm like, God, man. So that was defeating for me because I'm the team sergeant, right? Right, right. There's nobody around. Right. It's just me and my team, and I'm fucking defeated. Like, I am just pissed, Yeah. right? Um, so I go outside. I'm like, God, what the fuck just happened? Of course, we look around, we find a hole, make sure nobody's hurt. But I go outside and my guys come out. They're like, hey, yeah, Jay, like, nobody heard anything. Like, nobody saw anything. Like, like we can call this good and be, be done, right? But, of course, we know, like, that's not how that works, right? Especially when I, as the standard bearer, told my guys, when doing counseling, hey, if this happens, this is the consequence. Right. Now, I can't now turn back and say, hey... 
it's me. You're right. Do you what, know what I mean? Yeah, do what I, do what I say, yeah, but not what I do. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So I had um, three months left, so I called my uh, uh, company, Saw Major. I was like, hey, man, like this just happened. Uh, my Fox is going to be in charge of the team. In the meantime, like I'm, I'm just going to go to SWIC. Because at that point, I had already lined up a first song job at SWIC, right? So I was like, hey, if it's cool with you, like, I can't stay on the team and have double standards going That's on. That's pretty right? hardcore that you yeah. fired yourself from the team oh, I, because you didn't meet your own standards. That's that's hardcore, well, I, man. I, I, I didn't fucking like it. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I didn't like it. My guys didn't like it. But at the end of the day, though, like I couldn't honestly... Yeah, yeah. Like, not... I, I wasn't going to kill myself, but I couldn't look at my guys the right. same way. Right, mm -hmm. yeah. Because at the end of... Like, in the back of their minds... Even though they didn't have a problem with it, it would still be like, oh, like he had an incident and he's still yeah. here. Yeah. Or at least in the back it, of my and mind. It, it gets right? harder to instill discipline at that yeah. point once like you've you've sort of laid down a law yeah. and the, or standards. Yeah. And then, you know, and then, you know, they're human error. Yeah. And yeah. 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 So it sucks. So I, you know, told my my song major, hey, this is my, what my plan is. Fox took the team. Uh finished it off, and I went to SWIC, right? But when I got to SWIC, um, since I had already, like, laid out the job and I had the NCO ERs and I was honest with them, um, then it wasn't a big deal because I went to the CSM. I was like, hey, like, I had to leave three months early. This is what happened. Like, um, do with that information whatever you see fit, right? And that's when he was like, hey, man, like, I've known dudes over at the unit that blew their leg off. Or I've known guys that's done X, Y, and Z. So the the fact that I was open and yeah, owned yeah. it yeah, yeah. went a long way, which yeah. is why I try to tell these kids nowadays, shit happens to all of us, right? It, 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 we all have bad days. But what you do about it, that's what really matters, right? Like, holding yourself accountable. I didn't have to fire myself. Right. I could have let my team cover it for me, but at the end of the day, that wasn't the right thing to do. And right. I knew, like, that would fuck with me. And in case in point, um, the following, the following uh, month, another sister team had a similar incident, and the warrant tried covering it, right? And then battalion find out yeah and then yeah. group find out and it's like a whole fucking shit show it's, right it's the cover-up that becomes the problem yeah. right yeah yeah exactly yeah. so i'm like i'm sitting back like Whew, i'm glad i did what i did you know <laughs> what i mean um but yeah so i go to swick and but at that point you know i'm i'm behind the desk as a first sergeant uh, i'm like man this is fucking horrible <laughs> yeah <laughs> what is this <laughs> dude it is not and i was like god leave so I'm sitting there fucking working on TPT reports and telling guys what to do. I'm like, Jesus Christ, man. Like, <laughs> like, I need to do something else, right? So I jump on CIA.gov. And I'm like, hey, like, put <laughs> Save me in, me. coach. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> I go through that process. I fill out a packet. They send me all the paperwork. And then, um, then I had to sit back and just kind of think about it. I mean, I'm like, man, like, this is, like, I'm 19 years in, like, like, what am I doing? You know what I mean? Because I was chasing yeah. that high. Yeah. That, and, and I was being selfish because I had two kids. Like, I have a six-year-old and a three-year-old. So I'm like, man, like, I spent, you know, 19 years doing this. Doing what you wanted to do. Yeah. Yeah. And now I have, I finally have a chance to make a decision that's going to be my own. And I'm choosing to keep going down this path and ignoring what matters. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, um, so yeah, then I was like, you know what? I'm done. Um, and I felt comfortable saying that because we didn't have anything going on. Yeah. Right? Iraq was dying down. Mm -hmm. Afghanistan is dying down. Syria wasn't a thing anymore. So I'm like, I could comfortable, like I comfortably say, hey, I've had enough. Like, let me go focus on, you know, like my family. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what I did, man. It's, it's, it's it still sucked. Um, right. I got out and I was like, "Fuck, man! Like this is worse than being a first sergeant." <laughs> um, so I had to find something to fill that void. I yeah. Had to find something to do, um, and that's when I got on YouTube and I was like, "I like, like the most fun I I've, I've had, aside from you know being non range, was when I would had my team and I would help those guys problem solve. I would give advice and watch it play out. Right. So I was like, I like to mentor. Yeah. Um, so I started YouTube, man. I'm, now it's like, how do I help 
the younger generation of SF guys get to where we were? Yeah. Right? Like, how do we, how do I help them become successful? Like, avoid all the pitfalls that we went through. Like, you don't have to go through, through three divorces, right? You don't have to do that. Right. <laughs> you can if you want to. Right. But you don't have to. And this is how that can play out, right? When you're back home, instead of, you know, spending eight hours in a team room drinking beer, hey, Go home. Man. Right, right, <laughs> like, right. You know what I mean? Like, uh, you don't have to go to jail for, you know, selling fucking fuel or whatever. Like, these are the things that I've seen, um, like, play out. You can do it different. This is what it should look like. Just coaching and mentoring the next generation. Of so guys, your, your channel is the Green Beret Chronicles. And, and is that sort of, like, the theme overall that it yeah. takes that you're, yeah. you're trying to impart some of this information yeah. to yeah. a younger yeah. generation? Yep. Yeah. Like, all the... Because you, you, you mentioned Vietnam earlier. Like, yeah. Could you imagine what it would look like for us doing the global war of terrorism if we had Vietnam era Green Berets right. shedding their stories and what they went through, yep. Mike Force and all that stuff? Could you imagine? Like, some of the mistakes we made in Afghanistan, we probably would not have made them. Right. So it's like, now we're at that road to where, like, you have three separate war veterans. Like, we have Syria, Iraq, mm -hmm. Afghanistan. Yeah. Like, three separate um, countries that we were involved in and so many lessons learned that we can share with this next generation. We're no longer in it. And that information is just going to die with us if we don't do anything about it. So why not share it with the next generation so right. they can learn from it, right? And make better decisions. So, uh, you know, I want to hear you, you know, sell the channel to our viewers out there. Yeah, sure. What, what are like your, your, like, if you had to pick like your top two or three favorite videos that you've done that you'd like people to go check out on there? All right, so the first one's going to be, ooh, man. All right, so I have one on there that talks about what you should do as a new guy when you first show up to a group. Because right, we all know everybody shows up, hey, Sergeant Major, I want to go on a Halo team. Don't do that. Right? <laughs> go watch that video. It'll be very insightful for you. And that's uh, GreenbergChronicles.com. Right? Um, another one I had is Women in Special Forces. Right? That's a sensitive one for some folks. Right? On there, I share my thoughts. Uh, and they go is it along. spicy? It's very spicy because <laughs> it goes along something like this. Don't put them in there. They're going to destroy my team room. Because right? we're men and we want to put... Our stuff and stuff. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, so that's the second one. And then the third one that I have on there that's gained a lot of traction, believe it or not, is um, minorities in special forces. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right? Um, and on there, I just elaborate on um, exposure. Yeah. Because growing up in this very town, like even, you know, going from GFK and, you know, driving to lower Manhattan... All I saw was, you know, basketball courts and all of that. And I'm like, man, like, I need. I went and I linked up with a buddy of mine that's currently recruiting. I couldn't even find the recruiting office. It was like tucked in, like behind a wall somewhere. And I'm like, dude, like, exposure would have went a long way when I was growing yeah, up. Right, if I yeah. knew, like, Green Berets existed. If I knew Navy SEALs were a thing. If I right. knew about comeback controllers, more sock. Like I probably would have just there is a the there is a perception out there, yeah. you know, that I mean, I want to hear your opinion, but I think mostly it's wrong that there's a perception on some that special operations as a whole is like a white boys club. No, no, not at all, man. Especially over third group, and I'm sure fifth mm -hmm. group, seventh group. No, not at all. Um, but that, again, that's that, the exposure that that's the yeah. exposure because, like, once we find it, just I I found it. Yeah, it was five years within my career, but once I found it, I couldn't get it out of my head, right? right? So I went and I tried out. Um, and that could be said with any race, yeah. right? Um, seventh group is full of Hispanics. Fifth group has their majority of, of, of black dudes. Third group is, you know, um, dude, I, ha I was on a team with three black dudes, right? My team, um, my uh, team, when I was a team son, I had three Hispanics dudes in there. So it's definitely a melting pot of yeah, dudes, yeah. right? And when you think of the missions that we do, it's 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 beneficial right but again it comes down to exposure and now that um social media is starting to become a thing it makes exposure a lot easier yeah do you right. think there's also because i wasn't it jason when we had him on the show uh he was on a college campus and talked to a cia recruiter mm -hmm. uh who was also who was, i think the recruiter was uh 
also black. And Jason said, well, they don't want somebody like me. And the recruiter's like, don't self-select. Yeah. Like, yeah. Do, like, they'll tell you if they want you, yeah. but don't self-select based on some false premise yeah. you have. Do you think that's also an issue with... Yeah, I think it is, man, because a lot of folks um, see it and they don't see themselves, right? Because we're not out here like that. Right. Yeah, yeah. And the folks that are, they don't look like them. So they're automatically thinking, oh, man, I don't belong out here. Oh, I shouldn't be out here, right? Well, that's not the case at all. If you self-select, regardless of how good you are, you're not going to make it. Right. Right. Show up and let them tell you whether or not you're good enough. Right. Right. Um, but, yeah, I just wanted to break that mold by coming on there and saying, hey, check it out, man. Like, yeah. That's not the case at all. We're not there because... Um, the exposure just isn't there. Right. right. No fault of the regiments on fault. Like, no fault of, of the regiment. Like, the exposure is just not there. Right. I didn't find out about it till I was five years in. Right. Uh, and the other services, they do a really good job at um, recruiting. Like the Navy, they go to the NFL combines and they recruit out of there. Right. Yeah. They're in the colleges. I don't know why the Army doesn't, but. Um, exposure, man, that's what it comes down to. And now with social media, like I try to do as much as I can to expose everybody that, hey, SF is for you. Like if you don't like math and you don't like all this other stuff and like if you want to go towards the military and do this type of work, it's okay, right? Yeah. We're not all supposed to be normal, right? Yeah. Like, it's all right to want to go jump out of planes and, you know, shoot dudes in the face. And, yeah. Like, it's okay. Like, yeah. It's all right to you know, to not fit the norm. You, right? you, you mentioned like mentoring the younger generation, but you also sort of, you know, you touched on both when you came back as a 12 Bravo, having seen this stuff, and then also, you know, your misery as a first sergeant and then mm -hmm. a civilian. You know, we see things like with SF groups now getting in trouble. The guys who were like, who were at that 100 mile an hour yeah. limit and now it's not there yeah. and finding a difficult ways or finding it difficult to to fix that, yeah, right, yeah. and to deal with that. What do you think, aside from the younger generation, what do you think of like your generation of guys? How are they managing? What services and help do they need? And what personally do you think, like what helped you like manage that? Yeah, so um, two things, right? So idle hands, like we just had a big incident over a third group. Um, I read your article. <laughs> it was awesome. <laughs> <sighs> the boys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, we just had that big incident, and it's idle hands, man. Like, guys came in to go um, kick in doors and do work, and now it's no longer a thing. And guys just don't know how to, um, you know, conform to anything else. Mm -hmm. They don't know how to um, get back on the right azimuth, right? Um, mm -hmm. So they're going to find ways to entertain themselves. And what I would say to the leaders um, and I say this all the time on my channel is you got to keep those guys engaged. Mm -hmm. You got to give them something to do because if you don't, they're going to find things to do and you're not going to like it. Mm -hmm. So get creative as a team son, as a team leader, get creative. Make sure that training calendar is, is full, mm -hmm. like no white space. If guys don't have that time available, they're not going to get in trouble. But you got to keep them busy. Mm -hmm. um, and for the guys that are getting out, like you got to find that purpose. Right? You, you, you got to because you're going from you know, doing something that was incredibly, like, um, rewarding, um, and now you're, you know, just at home, and you're just babysitting kids, you know, like, you don't have anything else going on, you, you are, you went from 100 miles an hour to just complete stop, right, so what is that next purpose, like, what is your entire mission in life, and a lot of guys don't have that second identity, they don't, like, they think they're just a Green Beret, and that's it. Right. Right. So they come out and they're like, oh, I used to be Tom the Green Beret and now I'm just Tom. That's like, dude, it's like you can do other things. Yeah. Like yeah. the Green Beret is not who you were. It was just a section of your, it, it was just something that you did. It was just a job. Right. You're still a father, a son, you know, a pastor, like whatever. Like look towards those other um, uh, uh, qualities and start tapping into that. Right. Like find ways to. Um, give purpose to your life because mm -hmm. if you don't then like dudes are killing themselves over this shit yeah. man because they don't have an, another identity outside of the job that they used to do what, what has that been for you like what what shape has your life taken after retiring from the military I mean yeah. it sounds like being a dad big yeah. part of your life yeah so since I've been out man like enjoying my 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 uh, kids more you know what I mean just watching them you know wake up and coaching t-ball taking them to jujitsu um 
And then my purpose has been, you know, like I said, through the YouTube channel, I've been able to find my purpose and my voice. Yeah. You know what I mean? On top of, you know, becoming a better dad and realizing, holy shit, if I had gone this other route, I was going to miss all this stuff. Right. Like, there's a lot of people that we probably know that, you know, they're, they're, they're at a point now where their kids don't even want anything to do with them. Right. Like, they, they call their kids and the kids are not picking up. Right. You know what I mean? Like, they don't even want you to be a dad. Like, yeah. I, don't, I wouldn't want to put that on anybody. Yeah. You know, um, dealing with my kids now. You know what I mean? But that's what it's going to get to if, if guys don't find ways to kind of hone in into, like, their secondary life. Like, right. Right. It's, it's a small chapter in what you're meant to do. Yeah. You just have to find what that next purpose is. And we do a lot, like, we sell ourselves short a lot as SF guys, like, not realizing what we're worth. And the Army does a good fucking job at <laughs> making you think that. Right, hey, reinforcing that. Yeah, this yeah. is all you're meant to do. But then you come out here in the civilian sector, and, this dude, there's so much mm -hmm. stuff that we learn as SF guys that is valuable out here, right? Like, this, uh, there's a ton of shit. And the more I get out and I talk to people and I, you know, um, network, I see it. I'm like, dude, you used to be in soft. Like, look at what you, like, it, there's a lot more out there. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Guys just sell themselves short. Yeah, I mean, it's like a really important message, I think, because you're absolutely right that there's so many guys who are like, I'm just a big dumb ranger. Mm -hmm. I can't do anything. It's like, no, man, no, you, you can go do anything. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, those guys can go out and they can get a business yeah. degree or they mm -hmm. can do something. Yeah that I, I could never do. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I mean, especially I feel like a lot of the younger guys yeah. get down on themselves like that. And it's really important to like yeah. make sure they know that like you can have an entire second yeah. life and yeah. career. Yeah. Like if you can do like special operations, whether it's Ranger, SEAL, MARSOC, SF, like there's nothing that you can't do. And that's, that's the mindset that I've adapted. It's like, dude, I go to other countries and I topple governments if I need to. <laughs> right. So you're telling me like right. creating an LLC and starting a business in the United States is difficult? Right. Like, no fucking way. Like, right. I'm going to crush this. So, right. And that's the mindset that I've just taken on. It's like, dude, I go overseas and I do the impossible. You're telling me I can't start a YouTube channel and grow that bitch? No. It's fucking <laughs> right. Happen, right. Right. And that's the way guys need to think. It's yeah. like there's yeah, yeah, nothing yeah. that you, if you can do what the top 1% of the 1%, you know, is doing just like we've we've done right there's, a, there's, there's nothing you can't do you yeah. know what i mean and that's how guys need to approach it and so where can people find you if they want to find you on youtube or they of want course. to find your other endeavors out there where, where can they f uh go find jay uh sure man so um instagram uh greenberry chronicles and then youtube uh greenberry chronicles and then the website greenberry chronicles.com uh, we offer uh mentorship um, we also offer uh, rock programs and also uh, training programs also in there. And we'll have links to all of those down in the description uh, for you guys. And also I'll take two seconds to plug uh, the Team House Patreon. If you guys get on there for $5 a month, you get all these episodes ad-free and you keep the channel running. We really appreciate all of you guys. Um, Jay, Dave, fi final thoughts? Anything I failed to cover here? No, man. Everything was uh, perfect. And again, man, I, I appreciate you guys giving me the opportunity to come on and speak a with you guys. Any oh, time, it's our man. pleasure. Yeah. Anytime. Yeah, you're welcome. Any, come if you back decide to move back want. to Brooklyn, we got you, man. <laughs> you, you can come on anytime you want. My wife would kill me. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, man, I appreciate it, guys. <laughs> awesome. All right, so we will uh, see you guys next time.